Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's um, welcome. It's Friday, May eighth. Um, welcome to the noon time uh, meeting of General Housing and Military Affairs. We're continuing our conversation on housing today, and um, specifically to discuss a little bit from what's happening in other parts of the state. We have heard from Central Vermont, and we have heard from uh, Chittenden County, and today we have two witnesses here right now, um, Josh Davis from Brattleboro and Liz Reedy from um, Liz Reedy from Addison County. Are you in Middlebury now? Or are you, where are you, Liz? Um, the show, John Graham is mostly in Virgins, but we do have one property in Middlebury. Right, okay. So we will um, hear from Josh first and then Liz, and then we're gonna be joined by uh, Josh Hanford from the Department of Housing and Community Development, and we want to follow up on the conversations that we had last last week with DCF and AHS, and get an idea of what the housing folks are talking about. Because we had talked about uh, we've we've been talking about rental assistance, and we've also been talking about the the, the concepts in H seven thirty nine, the rental registry, and. Uh, um, rental safety have popped up uh, in different conversations over the last couple of weeks. And so I want to get to that as well. Um, earlier this week, we talked about the possibility of dealing with the craft beer uh, folks on Tuesday of next week. And I think we're going to postpone that. And the reason for that, I was asked to postpone that because the letter that was sent out was actually sent to the administration. And, and so it's being dealt with at least on the first level with, um, with the administration and we were just asked to hold off on on hearing testimony about it right now just so that the uh, administration can process some of the requests that were put in there there while there was a fiscal request there was also a handful of other requests that would be dealt with either through continuation of what's already been put out in the addendums things like the liquor sale being um, restaurants being able to do takeout um, liquor drinks or beers um, but there are other things that we can handle as well. But I think we're going to keep focusing on housing for the time being and really try to put together as as the appropriations committee is starting to talk about what's going to be in the budget adjustment. We don't have much to do with the budget adjustment, but when we start dealing with what they're calling the skinny bill, I think this is the first we, we, we need to start thinking about, again, the short, medium and long term issues and also getting an understanding of how this CARES money can be spent. And this is something that's come up again and again. I mean, it, I mean, if you had to ask me today, can CARES money be spent for the things that we've been talking about with respect to getting homeless people out of the shelters and, and into someplace more secure? Uh, the answer would be yes, maybe. Uh, a lot of the guidance that happens, that's been happening that we've heard about through um, I've, I've asked leadership. I haven't been able to talk to JFO, though there is a, the Senate did talk to Steve Klein a little bit yesterday. And there's a lot of caution going on with how this money can be allocated. And so we're still trying to figure that out. And basically, one of the major reasons is that every time we think that we have an interpretation of the law, um, for instance, there is a use on capital expenditures that can be done. Well, you're thinking, well, it, in the sense of broadband, uh, using some of the CARES money to extend broadband into some of the some of the dead zones in the state. Well, that's a capital project you have to build. And uh, in order to get homeless folks out of the hotels and not put them back into the shelters, we have to buy and or build. We have to have a capital project. But right now, the interpretation is that, yeah, that may not work. And so there's a lot of caution. There's a lot of guidance that's changing every other day. So um, as we begin to develop the framework that we want to see happen um, along with the advocates, along with the Senate, um, we just have to take that as a cautionary tale that we're still learning what is available at the, in, with the CARES money. Um, and, and, and on top of it, there's a huge amount of competition, obviously, for the CARES money. So, um, so we're going to continue the conversation on housing and try to build a good, a good structure um, and really listen to the folks we're going to listen to today and, and get an idea of, of um, what's in front of us. And so I'll start with Josh. Um, Josh, you um, 
were invited last week, but or two weeks ago, and couldn't quite make it. But there were folks who shared your your um, op-ed that we've just now shared on our on our website. And I just wanted to get a feeling from you uh, with the work. If you could explain to us the work that you do do mm-hmm. down in Brattleboro, and then just give us a sense of what you see. You know, go beyond a little bit of what you wrote about, but just to, you know, we. We did something here that's extraordinary after, you know, how many years of talking about it, we got every homeless person who we could get off the streets and into ice, you know, four rooms, four walls and a roof. And, and it took a pandemic to do it. It took a situation where there are no tourists, so these hotels were available. Um, but you have, you, you just share with your experiences what you see and what you want to see happen and what you think can happen. I mean, I, I have a hard time thinking that once we've housed people because if it's an emergency, it's going to be really difficult to say now that the emergency, when the emergency is over, you're on your own again. So uh, that's where I'm coming from a little bit and um, microphone's yours. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, and I really appreciate the kind uh, opening. I do think we need to celebrate what we've done and to acknowledge what's happened in such a short amount of time. It's really unprecedented. And so again, I'm Josh Davis. I'm the executive director of Groundworks Collaborative. We're in Brattleboro. Uh, Our services include a 30 bed year round shelter and a 33 bed seasonal overflow shelter, a day shelter, a food shelf, case management services, and representative payee services. So in essence, we think about ourselves as food, shelter, and supportive services for our neighbors in need. And thinking about, you know, just a little bit of context on what we've seen uh, over the last couple months as COVID was descending upon Vermont, we completely changed our service model. Uh, We were fortunate to be able to work with the stellar folks uh, at the state in particular. Uh, I have to put in a plug for Sarah Phillips at OEO. Her leadership in those early days was fantastic and huge kudos to the work that her, that she and her team did. And so in that process, we closed the seasonal overflow shelter and moved people into motels. We closed the day shelter and we reduced the number of people in our year round shelter so that it was just one household per room. We also closed our food shelf to walk-in visitors and started making emergency food deliveries all over Wyndham County. So presently, and uh, Representative Stevens, you were just talking about data that you're getting. Uh, Data was updated today for us and we are still getting more information as we go, but presently we are supporting 135 adults and 16 children in four different motels in Brattleboro. And just for some context, that's about four times the number of people that we typically support in our seasonal overflow shelter. And at the same time, our emergency food services, we are supporting 1,300 people in 965 households. And again, for context, that's about twice the number that we typically uh, support in an ongoing way. So I I think also giving kudos uh, to the Groundwork staff, uh, the response has been nothing short of extraordinary and they continue to show up each and every day throughout this crisis, assuming risk to themselves and their families to ensure we can continue to meet the basic needs of the people that we serve. And so I just wanna underscore the excellent work of our staff, but also staff across the state that continue to show up and make sure that everybody has the shelter and support they need. Often when we're talking about essential workers, it's grocery store employees, it is nurses and healthcare providers. And um, I'm not advocating that we be included in the messaging, but I just wanna underscore the fact that there is a whole host of people throughout the state who are supporting a number of our most vulnerable. So again, you've already acknowledged that, you know, in essence, we have stopped, we've interrupted homelessness throughout the state. And so what do we do? How do we maintain this in the face of everything that's going on? As conversations are starting to shift from surge and isolation to plateau and reopening. And so when we're having these conversations locally, I think we started with the assumption uh, you know, what if everybody who's in the motel suddenly had access to housing subsidy? 
we looked at that and quite frankly, we don't have the housing stock to meet that demand. At last check, Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust had only five vacancies in Brattleboro, which is an indicator of the extremely low vacancy rate. So then the question evolves to how do we bring 50 to 70 units of housing online in a short amount of time, the next few months? Elizabeth Bridgewater, who I, I believe you heard from last week, the executive director at Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust, and I have been exploring this question. And very quickly, our conversation turned to what existing properties already exist that have the number of units that are needed. And this has ultimately led us to the question of pondering purchasing a motel and continuing with the model that we've been successfully operating throughout this COVID response. As I've learned, because we're developing a project here uh, for Groundworks, we're developing a, a seasonal overflow shelter, a day shelter space. It's a roughly $3 million project that the organization has been working on for three years. And we just broke ground on Monday. And so that is in process. But I can't tell you the crisis of confidence that we had two weeks ago about building a shelter in the face of really solving homelessness. And we almost just took our $3 million of resources and bought one of the motels. And fortunately, I have good counsel that said, uh, whoa, whoa, you know, this is a COVID response and a short-term response. Let's think big picture about systems here. And the building that we're building will still uh, provide a use moving forward. And hopefully it's serving less people. We're building this overflow shelter with 34 beds. And hopefully there's not a need for that number of beds, uh, but there's still going to uh, be uh, functional homelessness, or hopefully we end uh, functionally end homelessness. So there's still going to be some movement through the system. And so then we started working with Wyndham and Windsor and turned to them and say, you know, what would that look like? So we identified some potential motel sites and are doing some kind of back of the envelope cost to try and get a better understanding of what this idea would entail. As we're thinking about capital investment, I would also note that a key to this model is the supportive services that couple the housing. And of course, Groundworks and Wyndham Windsor have experience uh, through this. We forged a strong partnership and gained invaluable knowledge through our work together on Great River Terrace, which I believe Elizabeth spoke about, the 22 uh, permanent supportive housing unit uh, development that we've done together that serves uh, folks have previ previously experienced chronic homelessness. And without a doubt, the key to the success of that project is the supportive services. So as we're building potential ways of moving forward, I just wanna underscore as much as we can to include services right off the bat, as opposed to what we had experience with on Great River Terrace, was we have one bucket or, or one group of folks that are working on the capital investment, and then the services happens elsewhere, but really fusing those two together, I think is important going forward. And, and quickly, Josh, just on services, have you estimated like what the percentage of any particular project is that would require those services or what the numbers are for the, and we, we don't hear as much about services as we do about, as we do about housing units, but if you could share with us just what your estimates are, that would be great. So right now, at, we, we're providing services, our base of operations at one primary motel in Brattleboro. And that uh, staff there is also supporting folks that are in other motels. But if we look at that staffing model, where we have roughly 60 people uh, in the motel, we're running um, three shifts. So we're running uh, two shifts, basically 24 hours. And then we have one eight hour shift that floats. And if you project that out over the course of a year, it's about $325,000. And so just to give a ballpark, um, and of course that's adjusted based on what the model we would use moving forward, the number of staff that we need versus the number of units that are on site. And that is not, and I would underscore this, it's not intensive case management services that this staff is providing there. This is just helping to operate within the day-to-day. -day. And I, I do think that that would shift as this would become a longer term model as opposed to a crisis response. Uh, the staffing would probably reduce a little bit in terms of the day-to-day, -day, but then we, it would increase in terms of intensive case management services. 
that wouldn't fall necessarily to one organization, we could definitely leverage community partnerships and other agencies that provide supportive services in the community. Does that help? And so I think where we are in this conversation is that the concept of purchasing a motel raises a number of questions not limited to these that I'm about to list out, but how do we sustain such a model? You know, we're talking about the infrastructure to get it going, but then what does this look like in the coming years to sustain? Would this operate more like emergency housing or would it be more permanent supportive housing? We would advocate for the latter, but what does that look like? What are the housing needs of people in the motels right now? I hope you've heard about coordinated entry and how that system is rolled out. And one of the elements of coordinated entry is establishing housing need. So can we take that information that we're learning through the coordinated entry assessments and tailor the housing implements that we're talking about to meet those? Uh, what are the number of units that we ultimately need? You know, I gave you an indicator from Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust. We know that we have a really low vacancy rate but what are some potential opportunities within the community for uh, extracting all the housing we can and really taking advantage of all the available units there are in the community? And what will housing needs look like in the next month, two months, six months, as the impacts of COVID continue to be realized? Moratorium on eviction will be expiring soon. We have continued uh, bleak economic picture. And so folks who have not typically entered the social service uh, programs very well may be calling on us and need intensive uh, supports as well, at least in the short term. And so I think what I'm here to advocate for is time. We need more time to dig into these questions. Um, and also at the same time, I would like to advocate for, let's lead with the goal of not releasing people into our community without housing and supports while we're taking the time to figure out what's next. And at this point, we don't have a clear understanding of when the emergency motels will begin to unwind, but I would advocate that we do everything in our power to make sure that we are not releasing people back into homelessness or on the streets to unsafe and unsustainable situations. Declaring a timeline would be extremely helpful, uh, both for planning purposes for us in the community that are looking at it, but also thinking about clients. Clients are incredibly anxious about the uncertainty of how long they will have housing and what next steps look like. I think uncertainty is a common theme right now and we're getting a lesson in that in all new ways with COVID-19, but anything that we can do to message to the folks that we serve about uh, expectations in housing would be much appreciated. And so again, just to underscore, we don't merely have to survive this. We're given a great opportunity to recreate and reimagine our, our communities. And what once was thought, really impossible is we're actually doing it. And so I'm really excited about the potential of what can come from what we've learned in such a short time. I believe you're muted. I am, thank you. Um, Representative Triano. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you for coming in today. And um, I guess, my question is, um, I, I, we've seen, I, I spent four years on Human Services Committee, and we've seen these um, motel um, projects work fairly well up in Chittenden County. Um, services are easier, a little bit easier to uh, provide, um, that um, the uh, duration of, of the housing is, is a lot longer. Um, it often transitions into uh, better uh, housing um, with the support services. So I guess my question is, when we talk about these motels, I, I you know, from staying in quite a few, um, some of them have kitchenettes. I mean, what work is needed for each unit to make it actually a livable unit to, uh, for someone? Uh, and, and what kind of cost are we talking about for that um, kind of a project? That's a, that's a great question. Yeah, we have a, you know, a little bit, I, I referenced some back of the napkin um, figuring that we're doing. I think what we've been talking about is putting in some sort of kitchenette so that there is a sink, a microwave, uh, something, and then making sure that we're connecting to emergency food um, in the long term so that folks are still able to access food. I think it's cost prohibitive to put in 
full kitchens at this point. I think it's something that we can look at. Um, and in terms of looking at some of the uh, units, you know, it's one of uh, the spaces that we're looking at is a roughly 50 unit uh, motel. And we're going by, by tax assessed value and then doing a back of the napkin, uh, maybe $10,000 per unit to get new um, carpets in there, a, a refresh, and then these kitchenettes installed with some plumbing. And so, you know, anywhere from about $2 million to purchase the property and then another million, million and a half for development costs to get it outfitted. And so uh, you're looking at close to $4 million of capital investment just to, to get it in ownership and then up to speed. So and that can uh, range would, you, would you see some savings um, if there were provisions for individuals to be able to prepare food in their unit as opposed to the three miles a day that are being delivered right now. I mean, would you see a savings there, you think? Yeah, and I think that we could tailor how we're providing some of those food uh, options to folks knowing that they would have some capacity for reheating or, or putting food together with the, the kitchen units, kitchenettes that could be in the yeah. units. Green and I think, snap. you know, we're really, we're really asking questions of what is housing? You know, I, I, I hesitate to say that we've housed everybody because people are in motel rooms and so we have sheltered it's we've done a little bit more than shelter but a little less than housing and so what is the model as we're looking to outfit these units that meets a, a baseline that is acceptable for folks to be able to meet their needs but also makes sense in terms of you know you're, you're talking about short term medium term long term is the motel option something that we want to keep in the long term is this a permanent supportive housing project that's going to sustain in the community? Or is this something that's going to be short and medium term while we figure out some other housing options? I think that's a question that we need to wrestle with. And it would also influence how much capital uh, investment we put in at the entry. I think certainly um, uh, the location of a hotel and in the proximity to your um, downtown services is something that we had a conversation about last week, as far as some of the uh, um, the uh, former um, low middle income housing units that were built so far out of town that uh, people couldn't walk into town to buy their groceries. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess that location issue it would be an issue as well, I suppose. Yeah, and it's something with Great River Terrace in Brattleboro, it's exit one, two, and three, and we're located right in town, not off a, an exit uh, off the right. interstate. Yep. And then, you know, Great River Terrace is out on exit three out Putney Road. And there's concerns about that isolation. And the uh, motel that we're operating our primary base of services out of is out on exit three as well. And we really do want to avoid a congregate site that's on the outskirts of town that we're isolating folks uh, and removing them from community. And so location is yep. key. Yeah, certainly um, a consideration or it should be. Uh, just right. one other one other question is um, we have a bill that's kind of uh, laying fallow right now about uh, rental re uh, registries. We've heard last week we heard a fair number a number of people mention that that could be a tool or an instrument that would uh, benefit uh, you folks in the attempt. Now you say five units uh, available uh, in in the Brattleboro area. I so would suspect that's more available and maybe that a, reg a rental registry would go further for your assistance as far as finding other places to live. So would that be accurate? I would agree with that. And I've been in touch with our uh, town planner, Sue Fillion, to get the information that she does have about rentals and, and try and pull some of that together so that we can see what available units are. We're also thinking, you know, are there units that are just barely offline, not that we need to develop new rental units, but something that might need a modest capital investment that could come up to speed. Um, it's really hard to capture that data. It's because it's not there, it's non-existent, but it's, it's something else that we've talked about as a community of trying to wrap our heads around. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. I wonder if using the motels as the short term, a short as a short as a present and short term solution. Um, I wonder if they turn into the shelters of the future where, you know, as long as you own them, you know, the, rather than the congregate setting uh, of, of a conventional shelter, I wonder if that's the, you know, down the line, that's the fate 
of of these per if if it's a purchased situation. Um, and I, if I could add to that, um, we've seen, and I don't know if folks have, uh, who have testified before you have spoken to this, but the ability for somebody to close a door and have their own room and bathroom has been profound for so many of the people that we work with. Mm -hmm. So I, yes, you know, we're building a congregate shelter right now because that's what resources allow when we are planning this. But if we had the option, the ability to close the door is huge. And, and the ability to cook. Um, rather than have to go to a cafeteria or, or uh, a congregate setting mm -hmm. uh, in a cafeteria. Clearly, we've seen in, in Chittenden County where the nursing homes, some of the nursing homes there have had some distinct issues, that, kind of the same issues that we felt might happen with, with homeless shelters, which was mm -hmm. just being the vector. Um, Representative Triano, are you, uh, your hand is back up. You're good. All right. Um, any further questions for Josh right now? I mean, this is, um, you know, there's so much to this about what uh, what the you use the you know recreate and reimagine, um, and I you know that is something that I always enjoy doing. I call it Imagineering, but it is. Um, Beyond that, it's really trying to figure out what are solid steps in the future. Um, I, I'd like to, Josh, if you could stick around for a while. Um, the uh, I'd like to pass the microphone over to, to Liz Reedy, who um, has been involved in state government on many, many different levels over the years, but has really um, since since I believe since you you left state government, Liz, you've been with the John Graham um, facility. And so if you can give us a, you know, give, give us a history of what the John Graham does. I mean, with the way that Representative Byron uh, uh, described it in our last meeting, it's far beyond what we would consider a conventional shelter system. And um, which reminds me, Josh, I'm going to come back to you uh, later because you mentioned that you also provided representative payee services to, and I'd like to hear more about that after when, when we come back to a larger conversation. Um, so Liz, the microphone is yours. Please, welcome, to, welcome to House General. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really uh, delighted to hear everything that Josh is doing and what a wonderful job he's done down there. I've always admired his work. And I want to, uh, I want to see your op-ed piece. I can't figure out how to do it online, but maybe Ron will tell me afterwards. But I'm, I'm really uh, kind of proud to see what's happening down there. So, um, so John Graham uh, is one of the oldest uh, so-called shelters in the state. We, we have 40 years of service to Vermonters, homeless families and individuals this year, started in 1980. And um, we now have five buildings and uh, the main, our anchor is the shelter as everybody calls it on in uh, yeah. downtown Virgins. We also have two other buildings in Virgins, a building in Bristol and a building in um, Middlebury. So we have over the past 15 years, I would say we've really kind of, our shelters are not like big barracks style housing. Um, almost everybody has a room. Uh, they may have a roommate. There may be two women in a room. Uh, there may be a family in a room, which can be tough if you've got a large family. Um, but we've really moved away from having bunk rooms and uh, to really trying to have a sense of home and a sense, a home within the building where the person is, and then a sense of community. Um, within the larger community, which includes making connections for people, um, jobs and housing and and care, quite frankly. So um, some of our so so basically we have three congregate spaces. Uh, we have some GA units where people that otherwise would be in motels have gone can go right into the unit, and then we have. Um, housing where people can kind of graduate to having their own apartment and then move on with a voucher. So, um, and like uh, Josh, I really do wanna really stress the importance of the services. So, but maybe I'll get into that. So that's an overall of John Graham. 
since uh, the crisis has been upon us, we basically have a four pronged approach. First, we are operating all five of our buildings um, with reduced census, uh, especially in the congregate sites. We have very few people there right now. I also want to um, second what Josh said about um, the Office of Economic Opportunity. Sarah has really been a true leader, um, I hope. And you know, I, I don't know if people realize both she and the commissioner I see as, as real leaders. Uh, they really know what's going on on the ground. Um, they're not afraid to give guidance. Uh, and they really, um, you know, you always feel that you are uh, working as a team and that has been so important to us. Um, they've, really, they've really stepped up in an amazing way. Um, so right off when the crisis hit around the middle of March, they were there and they gave uh, pretty much the guidance that people that had uh, underlying conditions would have the option to go into the motels. So some people from John Graham immediately went into the motels. Others didn't wanna leave um, the congregate setting right off. Um, many eventually went into the hotels, um, not all, but many. And, um, and we began, um, with our community partners. That's another great thing about this has been uh, how the, the county has come together and how the community partners have come together, both with the statewide partners, but also on the local level. Uh, we have the Charter House, we have the Parent Child Center, we have Women Safe. I mean, people have really come together as a team. So when I say this is what we're doing, I don't mean just John Graham, I mean, the whole continuum of care has really stepped up. So we, John Graham, are running our five buildings. Uh, we are working as a team uh, with our coalition members to serve about 73 people in motels. And that's with three meals a day, much like uh, what Josh described. Um, I can get into that a little bit more detail if you're interested in it. Um, we have a COVID-19 um, coordinator who makes sure that uh, all the team, that person is at John Graham, make sure all the team members have information, um, works with people on the statewide level. We have a website um, where people can volunteer, over 200 people have volunteered, um, and also clients or people who are homeless or people who are in need can say, hey, I need diapers, I love a crossword puzzle book, I need a buddy, um, whatever, I need milk, uh, I need shampoo. And, and we try to deliver those items with the food when the deliveries go out. So the three meals a day are going into the motels. And uh, we are really, I don't know if you've got the little flyer that I gave Ron, but um, we have been so fortunate with this uh, collaboration with Middlebury College. I can't say enough about it. Uh, they've been cooking three meals a day for people. And um, our staff at John Graham picks the meals up and we deliver them and it's just been amazing. Uh, the food has been great. Um, the collaboration has been great. And uh, it's just, we, we're just very, very fortunate. Uh, the quality of the food has been really good. Um, and so then the fourth leg on this stool is that uh, we have kind of pivoted to, well, we have always been working in getting people housed. So we have continued to house people in permanent housing during the crisis. We had a family of four that just went into uh, a three bedroom unit last week. And that was with uh, another amazing partner, which is the Addison County Community Trust. Um, analogous to uh, the folks that Josh was talking about down in his area. And they have been fantastic partners. I would second what Josh said is that they don't have the inventory. Um, so if we have the people in the shelter, the people in the motels, um, at any given point, um, I would say there's probably between 75 to 100 people in Addison County, maybe a little more, who are precariously housed at any given on any given night. We um, work with most of those people in one way or another and with our partners. So um, for example, 
they could be in one of our five buildings, they could be in a motel, they could be have moved on with a voucher and we're providing aftercare and support. Uh, we do have um, master's level clinician that can provide some uh, prevention and intervention services and help people with treatment and with, uh, we, really, we really emphasize a, a trauma-informed approach um, to getting people served, not just with housing and with food, but to really looking at the person. And I think maybe that's what um, Matt was talking about. You know, we really are working with employment. We're working oftentimes with medical case management. And we've been working, frankly, I don't know if you guys know this, but Matt has been an amazing partner in um, employing people. Uh, so many, many people have gone from shelter, they've gone down and they've gotten a job at Three Squares. They've moved up the ladder, maybe from dishwashing to cooking to helping. And so we really see our work as, as a home in a community. Um, so those, that's basically what we've been doing. And now we need to pivot a little harder to getting people placed into permanent housing. As everybody's mentioned, uh, the units just aren't fully there. So if I could, I just run down a few little recommendations or ideas um, that will kind of play off what Josh has said and also what some of your other witnesses have said. Uh, what's needed for the future? Um, I think the proposal that was put forth by Gus Selig has uh, a lot of merit. Um, the idea of um, e either building units or acquiring units and rehabbing them uh, and making them available uh, and, and coupling the, the new units with rental assistance, but also the services are a really, really, really key point. Um, if we're gonna do that, I hope that those units will be targeted to the homeless. Um, the bottom line is that there is a housing crisis in Vermont pretty much at all income levels. Uh, and it's real, and a lot of people don't have high income. So if we bring in a lot of units, there's a plenty of people that will be eligible for those units um, and they'll fill up quick. But I hope that uh, whatever is brought online will be targeted to people who are homeless and maybe even to people who have higher risks. Uh, for example, either the medical conditions or the mental health conditions um, that, that cause them to be really at risk for safety and, and for morbidity and mortality. Um, so yes to housing, housing targeted to the homeless, um, the service component, I think, can't, and we can't really say enough about it. And I thought that uh, Representative Stevens was, uh, was right on when he said, you know, we hear a lot about building housing, but we don't really hear a lot about the service component. And that's mainly why I wanted to come on today, um, because we really do appreciate all the work of the statewide nonprofits, uh, Housing Vermont and the housing authority and I mean we couldn't we couldn't be doing what we're doing without them and we wouldn't be in the position that we're in uh, with our buildings or the buildings that Josh is bringing online um, they're just really key partners but on the other hand the services uh, are, are really key like Josh's organization you know we're delivering food to people who are precariously housed or recently housed a lot of people with shelter plus care vouchers. We have a lot of people who have gone on uh, that have um, mental health issues or addiction issues, or they're just vulnerable people and they need care uh, in many ways. And it's a lot easier to stop by um, with a basket of food or to pick up the phone and, and just chat for an hour or to have a clinician just check in and see if we can just do some breathing exercises over the phone. I mean, we're not providing the full case management to everyone that we wish we were right now, um, but the services are really key to keeping people in the houses, um, keeping people housed. Um, the Another thing I wanted to talk about was the task force that um, Gus mentioned. And 
it's prop. I think it was Representative Stevens who said, "Does it need to be a new task force?" Or um, I guess I would just really advocate for including um, the homeless service providers prominently in that, um, so that it's not just about capital needs. Uh, so that it is about services. It is about people. Uh, it is about building, um, helping people get into housing, but also helping people within the community to stabilize and to become um, successful. And um, I think that, for example, if you're going to use some of the 1.5 billion for services, my own recommendation would be that that would go through the Office of Economic Opportunity through um, the Agency of Human Services. Um, I think that they really have the expertise and they really have the care and they have the connections with people in the community. Now, this wouldn't prevent them from issuing an RFP that was broad, which they often do. And um, there's some great partners like Pathways or um, maybe some of the housing organizations that uh, could certainly um, be participants in that. But I think that, that they really, you know, they, for our grants with them, they really couple the funding sources to kind of meet the needs of the community. And um, I just think they do a great job. So um, the only other thing I would add is um, there have been some challenges with some of the residents. I mean, I listened in on your committee hearing when they were talking about what was going on in Barrie. You know, I, I, I would just um, ask people to think, you know, I mean, I know the General Assembly pretty well, and I can imagine if we put everybody up at the hilltop <laughs> and served them three meals a day and, you know, any group of human beings are going to struggle in that setting you know, and served them three meals a day in styrofoam containers and told them they couldn't go anywhere. It's gonna to be tough, you know, any, any, uh, anybody is gonna struggle when it goes on for month after month and you don't know when you're gonna get out of there. So um, I just, I just kind of think, I hope that those stories don't get I'm sure that there are some issues. Um, we have had a few issues. Uh, people, sometimes smoking is an issue. Um, sometimes one thing that has been difficult is sometimes people's mental health is such that um, their trauma doesn't, they don't have a lot of comfort with being alone or isolated. And we've had some people that have had a hard time with that. And I think that that will continue. Um, I think that if we put people into rooms uh, when maybe they really flourish in, in more of a family setting, there's gonna be some issues there. You know, when we tried to keep people um, going in, in our congregate sites, what we found is, you know, people wanted to go out and go fishing or go riding around on a spring day. and. And it was sometimes tough to get people to understand you can't come back to the congregate site where there's seniors and people with underlying conditions. Um, and one of our service coordinators said something that really resonated with me. He said, you know, people are always in a traumatic situation. Uh, and this is a danger that they can't see, but so many people have had so many dangers in their lives. Um, this is just one more. And so that was really helpful for me to understand that. And I think we've probably seen that with our own friends um, that some people have really, really struggled. And that's how it is for um, the people that we're serving that are housing insecure. So I think that's about it. Um, and if you have any comments or questions, I try to we, we, we will. Um, just knowing that you're in Addison County and that you know Addison County so well, um, what I didn't hear about and what I don't usually hear about is uh, how, how are you finding any potential 
uh, growth in the homelessness issues or, or housing, you use the phrase precariously housed for agricultural workers um, in your in your community. Um, when we do hear about this, we hear mostly about the northwest corner of the state a little bit more than we do in, in Addison County. What's the situation down there? Well, people are housed on um, the farms where they uh, work. We don't see a lot of people coming into um, the shelter. Occasionally, we might see somebody seeking some kinds of services. Uh, the Open Door Clinic has been amazing, uh, and they provide health care and translators. Um, we work with people who, you know, we have, our organization has done a lot of work with asylees and refugees, just because um, I think that our board and our staff just feel a hard connection with people. And so we've taken people from, um, that have come in maybe through Chittenden County, but we don't get a lot of people coming from the farms. Um, and I think that a lot of the services that they're getting are going through the open door clinic. I don't know if you know them, but um, it's quite a great, great organization in Addison County. So. No, thank you for that. Representative Triano. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think you and I knew each other a long time ago, Liz. Yeah. <laughs> you were probably look different then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you and I both. So, <laughs> but, um, you know, just a few things. Um, you know, the committee has been, um, I guess, almost shocked, is, would be the word, to see that at this point in time, uh, compared to when we first went into session, that the number of homeless people in Vermont is almost doubled. Um, we were, it was reported about a thousand homeless Vermonters uh, early in the session, and uh, we're looking at almost 2,000 now. Um, so that, you know, that changes the picture some as far as finances go, uh, but I'm encouraged uh, by what um, you and Josh have both brought to us today as far as uh, what's being done and um, what's in the planning uh, works uh, for the future. So, uh, you know, the amount of money that it might take to get through this is staggering, but um, it's something that no one on the committee is ready to turn their back on because of what we've been through for the entire session and uh, what we're going through through this uh, pandemic. So, uh, you know, I wanted to thank both of you for coming. Um, I just wanted to comment one thing about uh, isolation. Um, the converse is also true. I think what I envision uh, oftentimes and have had some experience with when you bring folks in from encampments, uh, let's say, uh, who are, um, would be classified as chronically homeless, that um, uh, the converse is true. Uh, those folks don't integrate well with other people. Uh, so I think, I think we're talking about both yeah. uh, populations uh, when we look at the overall picture. Um, and I just wanted to uh, bring that up because, um, you know, there are uh, folks that go out into these encampments who try to bring people in and, and they don't have a lot of luck oftentimes. So, uh, you know, it's just another consideration. Well, you know, I'm not really surprised by the numbers. I think that um, we know that there were many more people. And as the commissioner said the other day to the committee, we always knew that the way that the point right. in time count was conducted was a flawed methodology in the sense of getting the full picture of people that are precariously housed. So for example, you know, I, I go, I have a little place I go down and sit by the river um, sometimes around sunset and just read a book. And uh, somebody came down there the other day, a woman that I recognized and, uh, you know, living in her car. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of that that goes on um, in Vermont. And, um, I think that there are very few people, whether they are people who depend on living with people or if they're people that are chronically homeless and have been in encampments, there are very, very few people who would not choose to be inside. And oh yeah, I agree. And as Josh said, you know, the whole idea of just being able to close the door, um, to lock the door, to have a little bit of privacy, to have a little bit of safety and, and comfort, you know? I mean, it could be sim something simple like a chair or, you know, being able to have a cup of tea or whatever it is, you know? Um, there, are, I know 
and I've done this work for many, many years, I know of no one really that wouldn't take that if they could. And so we do try to do the, ho the housing first model as much as we possibly can. And, uh, you know, we've gone out to people in encampments and we've said, we want you to come in. You know, we, we don't want to see you out here at 20 below. And, um, and it's not an easy thing. You got to go every single day when you put them into a unit because, you know, they're smoking, other people are stopping by, there's drinking, falling asleep with a cigarette in their hands. You've got to be there. You can't just put somebody into a unit and walk away. But if you do it, then the whole person changes. You don't even recognize them, you know. Pretty soon they look pretty good, you know. I mean, you see that they're they're talented person and they're, you know, they're handsome or beautiful or, you know, and they have all these, a lot to offer to the community. And very soon people can really have a, a very different experience in their life. Well, well, there's no doubt in my mind that that is, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, it's, it's yeah. when you bring someone in from an encampment, the amount of services that are initially uh, needed and afforded to a person can make all the difference in the world as to whether they can sustain, um, you know, uh, a living pattern that is not in a tent and wearing every piece of clothing that you have and a sleeping bag to try and stay warm at night. And also the health, you know, people's health. They need to, uh, people might, might have diseases or conditions. And if they don't, you know, they're really at high risk if, if yep. they're just out there and, and not paying attention to them. Yeah. And Josh? Um, yeah, yeah I just like to, if I could, I'd love to add to this. And I, I think right on with what Liz is saying. Um, one of the things to also keep in mind is that when we're offering people housing, thinking about the amount of red tape regulations, rules, things that people have to do to get into that housing. And we've really tried to be cognizant of making that as streamlined as possible because some people, I, I agree, our experience is that people by and large will want to come in, especially if what is being asked of them is a relatively low bar and not a really high bar where they really have to sacrifice their sense of self to come in inside. I would also, we're talking about services and naming services. And I thought it, it might be interesting to read this quickly. Um, I asked uh, Ryan Kendrick, our director of operations, why things were going so smoothly at the motels. Um, and she sent me the best reply in, in the early stages of this very succinctly describes our approach to services, which is support folks, care about them, tolerate challenges, have direct conversations, meet needs, buy tobacco, don't call the police for social work issues, work with all the hotel owners, answer when they call at 7 p.m. at night, get clinical staff on site, never give up on folks, avoid punitive measures, restorative practices, harm reduction, person-centered, and that's where we stop. Oh, that's great. Can, can you're, we- you're gonna, you're gonna send that to us, right? Because <laughs> I, I stopped at Buy Tobacco. I got, I got caught up at Buy Tobacco. Yeah, I'd love to have that, Josh. Yes, that's, I'll, I'll send that. I'll definitely send that to Ron. And that's, and that's, and I still say, is that all? I, you know, I mean, it's right. So um, Representative Gonzalez. Uh, Liz, I wanted to follow up with Representative Tom, um, Tom Stevens question about uh, agricultural workers. And one of the things that I am concerned about as uh, COVID will continue to spread um, and that it will, it will still be here and it will um, and for a while. And we're just, we're at the point where we will most likely not overrun our medical system, but we will still be spreading COVID for, for quite a long time. And so the folks that, that you serve uh, will continue to be most vulnerable and folks who are in agricultural settings in congregate housing on farms who will not have, who have not had and, and, and will not have the opportunity to self-isolate if someone that they're sharing living space with um, tests positive. And so just um, as we continue to move forward and you continue to, to provide services, I'm, I'm wondering um, if off the top of your head, it sounds like you haven't already um, thought about it, but ex um, thinking about how to increase outreach to folks who are marginally housed uh, on agricultural lands um, that are 
fine-ish now, but if someone in their in their housing does uh, test positive or comes down um, with COVID, that they would they would need you, um, and so needing to to have language services and outreach services and, and really thinking about that as your approach as we move forward into to this plateau um, that we're, we're moving into. Well, we do have, um, we have worked with a lot of uh, people with different languages. So we have that all set up and um, we had uh, family, uh, Spanish speaking, totally Spanish speaking family in the shelter. Um, for most of a year and you know we had the services and we were able to set them up for them and you know we're kind of lucky because we have Middlebury College and um, we also try to have when we can um, some diversity amongst the staff and we love to have staff members that can speak um, other languages so we're really conscious of that we don't always have it because we're little but um, and, but, you know, the college has been fantastic for us, you know, um, we, we had a family when they came to us, they only spoke Portuguese and, you know, they were from Angola, um, but little by little they've, you know, learned and they, they could, I can speak French, so I could speak with them, but, uh, yeah, I think that's a really important point. And if somebody, we did, um, set aside a unit, um, in case people did get sick um, so that we could put, have people go there. And I think also that it's possible for people who um, do get sick to go to Harbor Place um, up in Burlington. Of course, people may not want to, and, and I'm sure it's scary if you can't speak English to go up there. Um, but but we do have those resources and the open door clinic. I think one of the reasons you don't hear a lot about, um, I really, do, are you familiar with them? Representative Gonzalez? Um, I, uh, uh, yes, I have not visited, but I do know oh, their work. Yeah, they, they are. I think one of the reasons we don't get a lot of, uh, or hear a lot about people in our area um, is because they do such a great job. And they really, uh, they have a lot of, um, I think almost everybody on the staff is a Spanish speaker. And, you know, the, the referrals, they take care of not just health there, you know. Uh, Heidi is the director, she's just fantastic. And they're a very close partner of ours, so. Uh, yeah, but that's, that's a really excellent reminder. And I'm really glad you're on this committee to be, um, thinking about it because um, it's, it's really important. I wanted to go back to Josh on the representative pay. Um, Josh, I, I don't know if everybody on the committee knows exactly what a representative pay does. Um, and if you could just explain that particular service and why it's important to your, to your um, clients, that would be helpful for us as, yet another facet of what the services are that we would need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, representative pay services are folks that are on, or services that we provide for people who are on uh, social security and might have some trouble uh, maintaining their finances. And that could be either self-identified or working with social security as um, a requirement to maintain their benefits. They would work with our representative payee who will receive their check, help build a budget with the client themselves that make sure that their housing is taken care of, their bills are being paid, and then allocates uh, spending checks for folks each month. And we've seen the impact of this uh, be significant for people, especially as they're newly getting onto Social Security and maintaining um, payments both on bills, current bills, but also when they get into housing to stay current on rent because the rent is automatically vendored and people still have regular checks that come to them. So. And it's, it's really, I think it's important to clarify, it. it's primarily administrative. So the representative pays working with the person who's receiving this, it's not power of attorney. No. Um, it's just, it's basically saying to someone, you know, handling the checkbook and 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 um, whether it's teaching them advising them or working with them in order to pay those bills in order for them to stay 
um, current. Is that that's is that how you I do? Would agree with that. It's not, and it's not case management services. There's not an element of judgment about what people spend money on. It's more so just dividing up the pot in a way that makes sense that everything is covered. And so constant check-ins with people to make sure that the budget is uh, allocated the way that people want it to and in areas where they have choice and areas where they don't, we make sure that they stay on top of their, their rent and other necessities. I would add, you know, for some people, the idea is to help support them get through a period and then to exit the representative payee uh, program. And for other people, stasis is achievement and staying in the program and maintaining their bills over a long term is actually seen as a really positive thing. And your and your responsibility as a representative payee is also to make sure that they maintain uh, li there's limits on the amount of money that they can average in their bank accounts, and also essentially, if not doing the taxes, then doing the representative payee social security forms to make sure that they keep receiving the SSIs. Or That's SSDI. correct. We, yeah. we uh, compliance piece as well to make sure that they are in good standing with social security as are we. And that's something that we get audited for and we have to, accountability to social security. So there's oversight both internally and externally to make sure that the services that we are providing are by the letter. And there's a ton of guidance that social security provides uh, to make sure that people are taken care of. But because as you can imagine, this could be a program that uh, could be used as a means for exploitation. Um, and so there needs to be good oversight uh, in handling people's money. Right. No, it's, um, thank you for that. I mean, again, it's one of, I think what um, I keep saying about this pandemic or this crisis is that it's exposing everything about everything. Uh -huh. And so we're learning all these things um, that, again, just simply to say, oh, we'll get you housing isn't enough. You know, simply understanding that your your organization does this is really important to it's important to me to, to get a, to really get the big picture. Of, and I, of I would add that that representative payee program is a fee for service program. And so we do, it's a self-sustaining program. We are not getting other funding for this. I want to say per client, it is somewhere in the neighborhood of 32 to $35 a month that people pay for this service. So it doesn't come cheap in comparison to what the benefit is. And so we take our obligation very seriously in terms of making sure that people's bills are, are taken care of. All right. Um, all right. Any further direct questions? Um, we have, um, it's, it's almost 10 after and we're expecting Josh Hanford from, from DHCD at about one thirty. but I wanted to, well, first of all, I wanted to say, um, Liz, that Ron has told me that he has emailed you yeah. Josh's, um, thank you. So, Josh, just to show you how social media works, um, <laughs> Elizabeth Bridgewater shared that with us, and we shared it with the world, and now we're sending it directly to Liz. So, um, Thank you. But I would like to open up, while we have the time right now, with the conversations, because, uh, you know, there's, I'm, I'm grateful that we're hearing from, from Addison County and from... Um, Brattleboro, and I just wanted to, you know, put out there who are there other folks that we want to hear from? Are there people from um, Lisa and Mariana from your neighborhood? Are there people that you would like to hear as witnesses? Um, I don't want to take someone like Rita Markley for granted in Chittenden County. We've heard from housing organizations, but she is also the ED of COTS. Um, you know, are there other people that we want to hear from on and, and just to be clear when we talk about the money as well, the CARES project, the CARES money um, can own, would only be able to be used for housing the homeless at this point, because the idea of having a stay at home order means that you have to have a home. And, oh. and so it's directly related to um, making sure that there are housing settings for people. Again, this was an emergency that, and, and, and we lucked I don't even want to say we lucked out, but we we managed because there was no other traffic happening uh, in in the hotels that we were able to place people in. But um, um, I, I guess one direct question I would have is with the vouchers that you use, either the cold weather vouchers or the emergency vouchers. Now, are those averaging at about eighty dollars a night with the places that you're 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 um, 
placing people because I again using the Harvard Place model, uh, which they say they almost break even. So it's clear that the amount of money that they're charging the state for the but they're charging people they're charging the state for a room and for wraparound services at a number that's you know forty two to forty five dollars a night. And um, we know that from from the information that Pathways shared with us earlier this week that according to the number of people that they've been able to place in the counties that they work in, they're even just a skosh below that. And I'm just wondering, you know, in your experiences with these vouchers, um, are the hotels charging the same amount, you know, the $80 to $85 a night that we're seeing in Chittenden County and in Washington County? Well, um, Right now, the way the motels are working in Addison County is that it's going through the state. So the state is making the arrangements. Um, so if, if we have somebody that's eligible, we would uh, refer them to economic services and they would um, place them. Um, so I, I know that there's been some efforts to get certain room rates sometimes. Uh, now, when John Graham places somebody in a motel, let's say somebody calls in the middle of the night and uh, we've got to get somebody, we would, the way we would do that is we would just call a motel and try to get the best price that we can. We have at different times had arrangements with people um, for what the price would be, but it's, it's almost never $45, I can tell you that. It's going to be much more the sixty to the eighty dollar range. So. That's our experience as well. Uh, right now, I think again we are not directly paying for the rooms. The state is paying for the rooms, and folks are going through economic services. But the rate in Brattleboro is seventy five dollars, so around that eighty dollar per night, and that's just for the room. So in comparison to the Harbor Place, that does not account for the money the state is spending to support Groundworks and providing those services to folks in the rooms, which is a really interesting question. I know this uh, committee was grappling with the uh, GA restructure, which kind of got put on hold in some ways and kind of got uh, pushed into effect in other ways. I mean, if you think about the fact that our base of operations now is basically out of an emergency motel, it's a much different scene than what we were talking about with the, the GA restructure, but a nonprofit nonetheless is managing this emergency motel program. So I think it's fascinating to think about what we're learning now and how that would affect the planning and the rollout of the uh, emergency restructure if and when that does happen. You know, we have no idea what timeline looks like for when it's going to be safe or appropriate to unwind the motels and go back to business as usual or transition to this other model. Again, lots of questions on the table right now. And well, I think it's interesting with the with, with that model. I mean, we heard a lot about it and um, and yet it was still limited to the, you know, the cold weather exemptions primarily uh, or specifically because it was winter when we were discussing it. But um but it's uh, you know you're right. It's this was uh, this was something that um, we've all had to just rely on what we know. And I'm just so just going off on on that. I mean, so how much of this work that you've done while it's different, right? You're operating, you, you know, you're not operating the shelter, so you're operating these hotel rooms. But it seems to me that the that the way that you're able to go about it isn't surprising to you. Isn't out of your. It, it doesn't sound like it's out of you're not reinventing a wheel here. You're utilizing all the things that you've had, all the tools that you've already had in order to make this work. Am I, am I hearing that right? Yeah, I would agree with that. We're not having to reinvent the wheel. This is definitely within the wheelhouse of this organization and the work that we've done. And I think what we've been prepping for, I think what has been different is the scale. And so that it's been challenging to scale up appropriately. We are hiring people as other organizations are furloughing people or working from home or laying people off. Uh, we're actively trying to get people in the front door to help fill in shifts so that it's not our administrative team that's doing that work. And I also think that we have a good base of tools that we're able to rely on, really looking at coordinated entry. And we're gonna give uh, Sarah Phillips some kudos here again. She's worked tirelessly over the last few years to help roll out coordinated entry, which is, getting information about everybody who's in the system so that we can appropriately apply resources to situation. It seems like a basic thing, but it is, um, it, 
it has the potential to be a huge game changer. And I'm uh, anticipating that we're really gonna be able to see the impact of coordinated entry through this process to use it as a planning tool to get more resources into the community. And we have to target those resources based on what the real need is. Um, we, we've run almost, well, two crews. So we don't, we have the people, our, our staff members that go, uh, that are delivering meals, that are serving the people in the motels. And then we have the people that are serving people in our buildings. So uh, we haven't wanted to cross pollinate those just in case people did get sick. Um, and yeah, I would say, I would agree with what Josh says. It's not, it's within our wheelhouse to do this work, um, but we're trying to kind of keep both going at the same time. The difference in Addison County, I think is we don't really have any motels for sale. Um, and we, with the college, we have a year round uh, people coming in and wanting to be in the motels and not necessarily. So, so it's not like these motels are always gonna be available to us um, to have people in. So that's another issue. Yeah, I would add that there's no technically no motels in sale, for sale in Brattleboro either. Uh, that hasn't limited our dreaming and planning, but it could be a, a very limiting factor in the short term. You know, the adage is that everything's for sale, but it comes at a cost. So we'll have sure. to test that out. Sure. Well, you know, um, I hotel, go ahead, Matt. Yep, go ahead. The hotel availability, we, we were fortunate that um, this crisis hit during a tourist downtime. So that's why we had such vacancy rates and availability. If this were to happen during foliage or peak summer, completely different story. Yeah, I, I think that's clear too. I mean, that's the, that's the, the, the scales, right? If it was going to happen, I guess it's, you know, it had to happen this way. Um, I see that Josh has joined us. Um, thank you, Josh. We'll be right with you. Um, so, any further questions for Josh Davis and for Liz Reedy? Um, this has been very helpful. Uh, I would hope that as the state and as the advocates and as the um, as the legislature starts to formulate ideas, please stay in touch and share the thinking. Again, I don't want to take your experience and your knowledge for granted just because you're far away and not necessarily, you're probably more accessible now because of YouTube mm -hmm. and being able to see our meetings and know what we're talking about um, in real time. And so I would hope that you would be able to stay in touch with us with as, as we continue to discuss this issue because it's really, um, Again, it's exposing everything about everything. And I just really want to be able to make sure we do the best we can do um, with this under the circumstances. So thank you. But I see that Representative Howard has a question as well. Let's unmute you. Thank you both for coming in and testifying. And um, I wanted to say <laughs> so hello to you, Liz. It's been a long time. Yeah, I follow all your wonderful work, though. Oops. <laughs> thank you thank you thank you both yeah thank you all right um We're here so just call anytime you know matt is always knows where i am and you know so or pete well, he does our director and he you know so well that's right congratulations on your retirement start you know but don't stop working <laughs> um so um uh, welcome Commissioner, um, you Thank are, you. yeah, welcome. Um, are, are we the 47th meeting you've had today? <laughs> um, today, it, it, today's been, you know, medium light. <laughs> it's about the third Zoom call or Teams or Skype or whatever format we yeah. use, but uh, gotten, we've all gotten used to them by now. So the real challenge is when, um, you know, you're on one, you've just finished the last last one and all the action items are coming through when you're on the other one and you're trying to, you know, catch up um, real time. But oh, I was uh, really grateful that our floor time was done by 1130 today so that we had a little bit of a break, at least to um, to eat, you know, yeah, and step and, outside for a minute. <laughs> and thanks for um, 
pushing me back towards the end of your time to accommodate my schedule. Absolutely. We're very grateful that you're coming. Um, we wanted, we've, we, we had a conversation with commissioner Schatz last week and, um, and with his team, uh, well, with Jeff Pippinger in particular, and then, um, we haven't been able to get Sarah in, but, uh, that's, we've been getting the commissioner in. So I guess that's more than sufficient. He has shared with us some really key information about where folks are in the, in the aftermath, where, where homeless folks have been placed. And so I, I wanted you to come in because we hadn't talked to you since probably the end of March. Um, we may have talked to you right before, uh, we closed or right after, but it, you know, some of the issues that have come up recently in conversation, we just wanted a clarification on where you were, where the Department of Housing was, um, on not only on what um, what you're seeing in terms of uh, the overall planning um, that may that may be starting, but also um, we had can we have we wanted to get a an update on some of the perhaps the rental assistance or rental arrearage programs that we had started talking about in the normal course of business before before March 13th uh, with the HOP grants, et cetera. And um, uh, in particular, the HOP grants, but uh, uh, whether there were other programs that have been starting to be talked about. And then um, I believe you were out of town when we talked about the rental registry program in H739 and uh, Sean Gilpin was, was in your stead. And we just wanted to get an update on where you are with some of the thinking behind that. We've taken a lot of testimony, not about 739 in particular recently, but that the, the, that the notion of a rental registry has come up again and again as, as determining as we move forward in the short and medium and long-term thinking about where do we house these folks. Um, we have all done this, the administration, the state has done a great job in getting people off the streets and into these motel rooms. But we also know that an emergency period is gonna end. Um, motel rooms on top of that are not ideal long-term, but they've been, but getting folks off the street, getting an accurate count has been, has been incredibly helpful. So I just wanted to give you the opportunity to fill us in and uh, let us ask some questions between now and two o'clock. So um, microphone is yours. Sure, great. Well, thank you. Um, you know, for the record, Josh Hanford, Commissioner of Housing and Community Development in the Agency of Commerce Community Development. Um, happy to talk with you um, <clears throat> about what's been going on, um, what I know. Um, first off, uh, you know, we've been in lots of coordination with AHS, Sarah Phillips and Allison Hart in particular, and some of our other housing um, partners. Um, uh, VHFA, VHCB, sort of talking about the rehousing plan as, as sort of it's being loosely referred to, you know, trying to take advantage of this um, uh, place we're in where, you know, we have people housed, um, not in the best circumstances, but they're, they're housed and we know who they are. Um, we know the needs and how can we transform this into something that is, is uh, better than it was. We can't go back to how things were. And so there's been a lot of people thinking about this and what we can do um, to get there. And there's clearly very short-term um, immediate actions that need to be taken, sort of mid-range and then long-range actions. Um, and there's a little bit of uncertainty about the COVID relief fund and how those could be used for some of the more permanent long range actions we need from a peer timing perspective. And I'm not gonna pretend to answer those questions, the guidance from you know, the treasury, the, the, you know, our, uh, the state administration, um, fiscal office from legislature, everyone's sort of a little wishy-washy on what it all means. But um, what I can tell you is uh, a, a couple, couple certainties so we're getting 4.2 4 million in CDBG, Community Development Block Grant, COVID relief funds. Uh, we've worked really fast to put up a, a draft action plan. It's on our website right now, five days of public comment. And this thing is being submitted um, mid next week so that it can get a fast turnaround from HUD and we can get that money in our account and start um, uh, awarding it. And the plan there is, is three parts. Um, 
one of its small business assistants, you know, get small grants, you know, $5,000 grants in the hands of small businesses in Vermont, you know, Main Street restaurants, uh, retail to keep them surviving. And we have a, a partner to help us do that. It's modeled a little off after um, what happened after Irene. But uh, and then another piece that's, um, you know, grants to nonprofits and municipalities to help them with their sort of critical needs during this time. Um, you know, think, you know, restocking food shelves or Meals on Wheels, whatever. But the other piece is emergency rental assistance. Um, so the plan is three months, um, rental rearage, rental emergency assistance, however you want to describe it. Um, for three months, I think our estimate was we could serve 400 uh, households, four to 600 households with what we've set aside. So it, it's about... Um, 1.8 to the rental assistance program, about 1.9 to the business assistance, and then the balance to that small grant program. Now that's a drop in the bucket. It's not going to be nearly meeting the need out there, but it'll be you know something. And we took uh, um, comments from from uh, folks, and we had a public hearing, and clearly rental assistance was on folks' minds. They know that this is needed. It's not something we typically do. It's not really usually allowed with CDBG funds, but under these circumstances, it is. Um, we're uh, partnering with our home ownership centers, which are the nonprofit um, organizations around the state to deliver this. Um, they typically don't do rental assistance either, but this is sort of um, different than the public housing authorities and the Vermont State Housing Authority and the typical rental assistance they run. Um, we already have grant agreements with those folks, so we're going to quickly amend them, divide it up by uh, proportional amongst the, their service areas, and they can um, they already have those relationships with um, you know landlords and, and renters in their region. So that's one thing we know we can address um, this problem with. Um, the other piece in coordination with AHS's rehousing plan which I don't wanna um, you know, release, it's not, it's not uh, mine to release, but we are partners. And I think they're looking at this as a partner plan. This is not just ASS's plan, it's, it's DHCDs as well as VHCBs, VHFAs, the whole network. But AHS is still vetting this within their agency and various other folks before they release it. But you know, I can say that one element of that plan is to um, use as much COVID relief funds as, as possible right now. And part of that plan, um, we've been pushing at uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development is for more rental assistance, um, a big chunk for another tranche of emergency rental assistance, three months based on the median gross rent in Vermont. Um, and it serve as many um, households, you know, this is, this is going to benefit both the renters, you know, we, we can't afford to have another set of evictions and more people homeless. So that's why this fits in their homeless plan, you know, their plan to rehouse the um, 1300 households or 2000 individuals, including children in these motels, depends on not um, a whole bunch of new homeless people. So we have to um, hold the line. And so we can't be having evictions, not to mention you know, the court system clogged up, all the extra costs. So what can we do to help as many people, many new families not be evicted? Um, so that's a big chunk of, of these funds, a three month rental assistance um, proposal based on how much we can get out of this COVID relief fund. You know, we have a number in there and, and, and rated to how many people we think we can serve based on what we think we can get, of course, with, um, the administration and the legislature reviewing all these proposals in the very near term. Um, and we would partner with the state housing authority and others to disperse this rental assistance because it's going to be a much bigger package. In addition to that, um, part of that plan has a rental rehab component. Um, because, um, you know, the, the real solution here is not putting people back into congregate settings and homeless shelters, it's, it's permanent housing. Um, and there's a number of forms for that. You know, obviously we're going to need new permanent supportive housing that's developed, but that takes time to develop and to finance and to build. You know, even if you buy a 
a, a motel and refurbish it. There, there's time there. Plus, some of our communities actually have adequate housing stock. So AHS actually, you know, they recognized this earlier, talked talk to us and said, hey, shouldn't this be a component? Can we maybe retool VHIP? Um, and so we've been working behind the scenes on what that would look like. And they sort of have a target number of um, households that they think a program like this, a rental rehab, would fit nicely into their entire plan to rehouse this total group of people um, that is doable. You know, it, it, it's a rehab program that can get results in four or five months. Um, it clearly has a bigger incentive than the original plan of $7,000. I mean, for two reasons, you know, the work needs to get done immediately and you're asking folks, th this would be private stock, um, you know, rental, rental stock uh, of homes that are, you know, in need of code repair, some of them might be vacant and blighted, but um, you know this works really well in places like Rutland or St. Johnsbury or Barrie, where there's adequate housing stock, but it needs um, rehab. It's it's in poor shape. Um, but to convince you know those property owners to um, you know take in homeless people, that incentive, the original seven thousand dollars, and you have to match the, match it three times with private loans under these circumstances is not going to get the attention we need. So we're thinking bigger, bigger amount, um, you know, I'll sort of wait for the plan to be released. But I think it's fair to say that it's, you know, two or three times what we were thinking. And that for the units that would be dedicated to rehousing the homeless, that would function as a grant. And they would have conditions. They would have an MOU with the service provider. They would need to fulfill um, those commitments and keep those units uh, affordable for a period of time, even if the homeless uh, rehousing tenants to see ended or failed, they would have conditions to keep those units um, serving low income people for some foreseeable future. Um, so this is, this, this is, this is, excuse me. So this is just taking what was in 739, which is the VHIP program, which has been discussed. I mean, we passed a version of it last year that didn't go through. Um, but this is basically taking this program and um, refashioning it to the crisis. Um, exactly. It's, uh, I mean, it sounds like to me from just the words you use that it was a little bit of VHIP. It was a little bit of um, H448, which was a, the blighted properties uh, that, that Representative Walls and Representative Anthony had brought forward. And it sounds like um, if I'm not if I'm hearing you correctly, that it's. Um, that there is a proposal to make it at a higher level in order to get these these apartments online faster and to make it more attractive. But um, so that kind of language, where does seven thirty nine fit in, or the language that's already existing? Yeah, I don't know what the best mechanism. Um, you know, first this has to get approved um, from within the administration. It's been floated. Folks have seen. Um, there's a general. Um, support of this, um, but, you know, everyone's asking for this COVID relief money, you know, so much of it's already been spent. And where this shakes out and how it's presented to the legislature, and if all of the asks are gonna be in a new bill, you know, some of the language around VHIP that's in, you know, the Senate version and, and your version, it could be a basis, but frankly, there's a lot of changes. It might just be easier to start fresh um, you know, using that, that concept, the concept's still there, um, a VHIP, but it's going to have to have new sort of, um, you know, enhancements to it and some, some ease of, of, of some of the conditions, you know, if you remember VHIP was only for vacant or abandoned, you know, blighted, mm -hmm. we're going to want to expand that and, you know, sort of any apartment that has code issues or, you know, can't meet, um, you know, sort of a, a basic sort of health test. It doesn't need to be to the level that it's vacant. And so we'll have to change a few things. There's a, a white paper right now that's being developed that could be the basis for, you know, the new legislation or changing what we have. Um, I'm just not sure what the best vehicle is to get this funded, considering it'll be part of a larger package of ass. It, it might be better to, to place it there rather than, um, somewhere else but it's fair to say that for the units that would be targeted to rehouse the homeless the incentive would be more attractive it would be bigger 
It would probably be some sort of forgivable loan that converts to a grant once they've met the conditions. Um, and it would have to incentivize sort of immediate work. And, you know, the number range that AHS, you know, that how they're trying to scale this out and phase this out, this isn't going to be um, like the majority of households. You know, maybe we're talking 150 to 250 households, somewhere in that range that we could pull something like this off um, with these funds. So that, that's, that I think hits a lot of um, other goals. You know, once this housing is, is rehabbed and it's in better shape and it, you know, maybe we get past this crisis, it's going to have a, a purpose and serve, it's gonna serve a, a needed, um, a need in the future. So it's a good investment that still can deliver what we need at uh, a little lower cost than, than uh, building fresh new supportive housing um, it, the traditional way. But some of our communities don't have this housing stock that this can work. You know, it, it's not gonna be as many units available in parts of Chittenden County or in Lamoille County. You know, so we have to um, target this to places that have this sort of housing stock and it's not going to meet all the need. And I'm still somewhat concerned about um, the uh, conditions around, you know, all this money being spent by December 30th. Mm -hmm. You know, if we can make contracts, get people working, but all the work's not done, are we going to lose and have to pay back? We still need some clarity on that, but there's certainly a better shot at rehabbing an existing unit and spending this money than building fresh, you know? Um, so those are the two areas, you know, the rental assistance, a short-term rental assistance program to prevent new homeless, homeless um, this rental rehab. And then the next wave that's coming that I think when we get another um, chunk of CDBG money, COVID relief CDBG money, which we will, the next place we need to focus is starting on um, foreclosure mitigation. I mean, you know, there are a lot of homeowners in Vermont that are low income and they're on the edge. Um, it's not going to take long before we have a foreclosure crisis. And that, you know, prevent homelessness there is going to be where the next need is in, in five months that we'll be putting a program together to help there. And hopefully we have a lot of federal support um, because that's even harder to unwind and fix. And once people are displaced and out of those homes, the problem gets harder to fix. So mm -hmm. there's a lot going on. Um, a lot of people collaborating um, in good ways right now. And, you know, I hope that AHS is able to prevent this, present this joint plan very soon so that we all know what we're all asking for and we find the best vehicle to um, fund it, have the debates about what makes sense and how much, um, alongside everyone else's ask, you know, from healthcare industry mm -hmm. to education and public service. And, you know, um, because there's a lot of critical needs out there, but this is a time to uh, have a, you know, transformative change uh, uh, with, with serving the, the homeless. And I think everyone's on board with doing that. And, um, you know, there's some smart people that have worked really hard at preventing, you know, an outbreak and doing incredible work to get us where we are and we don't want to fall back. No, I appreciate that. And the work has been, the work has been really phenomenal. I mean, I think back on March 12th when we started this conversation, the idea was that the, um, the shelters would be incredibly uh, powerful vectors and we haven't seen that at all. Um, right, right. So Representative, H we have a couple of questions here, Representative Hango and then Kalaki. Thank you. Hi, Josh. Um, as you recall from our meetings up in Richford, um, we have a lot of issues with landlords, right? So last night I had a really heart-wrenching call with a landlord who owns quite a number of properties. Um, and this person, my constituent, is just absolutely falling into debt because she's got people who can't pay um, their rent. She's concerned about the length of time that she's going to have before she can set things in motion through a court process. She has been um, communicating with the wonderful program that Legal Aid set up in Franklin County with the courts to help renters with um, arrearages. However, that's just not enough. So she does really own 
a lot of properties. Um, and the danger there is most of the people are low income um, or on fixed incomes or receiving lots of benefits. So she really can't get money from a stone, you know? So my concern is for people like her who are struggling as landlords, they, they feel like they should be considered to be small business people rather than just landlords. And she's wondering what kind of assistance we're going to give to landlords because we're giving so much to people who are tenants. And right now the landlords are really struggling financially. Do you see anything coming down the pike that I can give her a little relief and say, you know, maybe by July, there's gonna be some money for you? Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, I mean, inbox is full of, um, you know, just awful stories of folks that are going through struggles um, like that, you know, um, folks themselves that are lower income and they're depending on their rent to pay their mortgage and their heat. And, you know, when when rent stops um, coming in, you, you can't pay the service guy to come fix the furnace or to fix the broken window. It just spirals. Um, I think these emergency rental assistance payments, rental rearage, however you want to define it, the idea is that three months worth of rent, if it's if it's been missed or it's been reduced, that money goes right to the landlord. You know, the, the, the tenant and the landlord agree, this is owed, it hasn't been paid. And the um, organizations we would use to um, administer this, the, housing, the um, homeownership centers would make those payments directly to the landlord so that they, they can um, continue to offer their, um, you know, properties for rent. Um, you know, if it gets to the point where people aren't collecting any rent and, and they can't pay their bills, we risk not having these places be habitable and safe places for people to live. So the, the idea would be that this would go to the landlord with, you know, some affidavits and things to make sure that they weren't paid through some other source or something else didn't, didn't um, assist them along the way. You know, and one of the um, interesting things here is, you know, the, the eviction of moratorium bill is, is passed. It's, it's on the governor's desk. I'm, you know, almost certain he's going to be signing it. Um, what not. Great work um, on all sides here, you know, but there's really important messaging that goes along with that, that, you know, to the extent people have been able to access unemployment or these other special programs, um, you know, food and shelter, you know, they have to be among the first things you pay for with those funds. Otherwise, our whole system doesn't work. You don't go into the grocery store and, you know, go to the checkout. Sorry, I can't pay. You have to let me take this. It just doesn't work that way because, you know, the housing system depends on payment by someone at some level. And so this is just a Band-Aid, this um, emergency rental assistance. But it would go to help some of those landlords. So, the first charge that I um, suggested from CDBG, that will absolutely be available in July. Um, this other COVID relief funding, you know, if we can make this way, make this through the legislature with the administration and get it um, in our hands quickly, it may even be available before, before the federal funds um, because it's already, the state already has authority to use the money for this purpose. Um, you know, I, I think that bigger picture, uh, um, there needs to be longer term rental assistance, rental assistance expansion. Um, that's part of AHS's plan. You'll see when it's released, they know that in order to rehouse the homeless, to keep more people from being homeless, we're going to need longer term rental assistance. People's incomes have been diminished. Their ability to work and return to normal has been interrupted. Um, we can't expect uh, housing providers, be they profit or nonprofit, to provide free housing. They have expenses too. So we've got to um, interrupt this and, and um, have this system uh, work as we need it to work. So uh, I know some of these landlords are holding on by, by fingernails right now and are really scared about um, what's going to happen. They don't, they can't kick people out right now. They shouldn't kick people out right now, but how does that serve them in the long run, serve any of us, but they have to pay their bills too. So I hear you. 
I just want to follow up for just a second on that. So if this does become available and um, the money is going to go directly to landlords if a tenant it has not paid rent in three months, how is that proven if the courts aren't working? At that yeah, time? so there is, as um, soon as this emergency order ends, um, you know, the eviction uh, moratorium bill, you know, I don't know it inside and out, but I know enough that um, you can still, um, file your, um, you know, if tenants haven't been paying rent, you can still file that into the court and, and ask the tenant to, okay, catch up on your rent now. And if they can't catch up because they don't have it, there's your proof that they haven't paid it. Um, I've talked to a counterpart in Maine, you know, they stood up a program um, really quick, two or three weeks, um, but they have a different system. They tapped into their, what we call our property transfer tax, and they produced $500 checks to 20,000 landlords ac across the state. $500, that's it, one time. But they said, if you take this, you and your landlord are agreeing, your landlord is agreeing to not evict you. It's only a partial payment, it's just one month, but we're giving you some money. Um, and they had a whole system to track that, an affidavit, and some of this, you know, you have to um, you know, use mechanisms like affidavits that, that can be checked up later. Um, you know, so, so everything's not going to be perfect, but there will be a way to verify whether someone's paid. Um, and we could use these partners that we have that, that do this work all the time and get to the bottom of um, if there's a disagreement between the tenant and the landlord, you know, the tenant says I paid. Well, you know, there, there's, there could be some investigation of, well, where did that money go? Well, let me see your bank receipts. You know, that, that will be um, verified to the ex extent it can. So just just so you're aware, and I know you probably are, but I'm going to drive this point home. Um, her concern was the bill that we passed is actually going to delay any action for another 30 days after the state of emergency is ended, whenever that may be. So by that point in time, she's already out, you know, like three or four months rent for every tenant who hasn't been able to pay. And if you're if you're a, a landlord and you own, you know, say 10 apartments or 10 properties or whatever, that's an awful lot of money, an awful lot of tenants who could just be not paying right now. And for some, to ask one family, one, one couple to swallow that and um, have no other recourse is, is I, I'm afraid for, I'm afraid for these people. I really am. I'm afraid that they're going to lose all the investment that they've had, that they've put in. And, and then, then they're, they're gonna have all kinds of court costs down the road and they may not even see a resolution to this. So, um, you know, I got beat up pretty hard last night about S333 that we passed. I, 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 can, vision, I can envision what, what you experienced. And, um, you know, the, the rental assistance isn't the only piece, you know, that can pay for rent that hasn't been paid, but you're right. Um, Landlords are small businesses. And, you know, so far the PPE, PPP and others haven't really worked because of determinations by SBA and others about that the business of being a, a property owner landlord. But some of the package that's in the economic recovery side of what our agency is proposing for Corona relief, um, small business such as landlords would be eligible for these other incentives, more grants and more loans, you know, 0% deferred payments that um, you know, I'm hoping folks um, like your constituent could take advantage of to at least slow the bleeding until things become somewhat normalized. Um, you know, and then also, you know, the, I know the eviction bill slows the process, but to the extent that tenants, you know, were receiving increased unemployment or receiving federal stimulus or other things, it doesn't stop the obligation to pay. Um, and so, you know, I've heard stories in other parts of the country, which I'm glad hasn't um, taken root here about, um, you know, rent strikes and things where even if people have money, they're being encouraged not to pay their landlord. And, you know, um, that, that just, you know, we haven't had that and I don't think we will. Um, but, um, you know, that puts a whole system in jeopardy. And when, when this bill is finally signed and we all start talking about it, um, all of the partner organizations having the same clear message that, you know, things are hard, we know it, but, you know, this is not a waiver of what you owe, um, as tough as that is on the tenant side as well, um, is important for us all to, to speak to. Thank you.
Representative Kalecki. Uh, Commissioner Hanford, thank you. And, you know, to, to see the response of your team and everybody's team, the administration in the past six weeks has been profound and how everyone dove in and, and it's really thrilling. Uh, we are hearing in the committee um, from many advocates in the last couple of weeks that there is a kind of synergy of focus that everyone's sort of aligned at this moment and this rehousing plan that you, you mentioned uh, that AHS is working on and you know interdepartmentally. Are the advocates also at those tables to kind of develop that this proposal? Yes, um, not everyone, um, but the the other advocates is a uh, um, you know specific uh, view in my mind. But there are other um, folks that advocate for affordable housing that are also funders like VHCB and VHFA. Yes. That they're at the table and where this the uh, and input has certainly been taken from those like CHT who has a proposal and others out there that has all informed this, but um, you know, the, the, the small circle of funders, you know, the five or so have tried to not, um, you know, if you let, uh, you know, one advocacy group in that circle of that plan, then you have to let everyone. So um, I don't know if it's fair to say that there have been entirely all part of the effort, but all the funders have, which include VHCB, VHFA, and Vermont State Housing Authority, which are all clearly connected to the advocates or the housing developers, however um, you, you view that. Um, and it's it takes into account some of their requests that you're all aware of around um, clearly a certain, the need for services. You need funding to go along with the units that you need and um, you need rental assistance. Those are the three things that make this work. Rental assistance, the actual units and the services. Um, I don't know if the exact percentage about how much should be new construction for the long-term solution is all the same, but all the components are in this draft plan that's been informed by their work. And are any legislators uh, working with, the, with any of you on this as well? Um, on this small team, there's not been a legislature in this group. I think that, um, you know, you guys are asking the right questions and are, are you know, aware that this is happening. You've had Ken in, you know, me, you, you've had, you know, Chris Donnelly, others. Um, I think we're really waiting for this plan to sort of break so we can all have, um, you know, full open conversations around um, the different components of it. And, you know, as I said, what, what I'm not clear of is how this plan fits in with like our economic recovery plan for the COVID money, you know, to pu public safety, health, education, everyone is doing the same work. And what do all these numbers add up to? And then what is the incredible hard work that you guys are going to have to do to prioritize these funds that seem like a fortune to even be talking about these numbers, you know, in a normal year? is just incredible, you know, um, but it's, it's going to add up real fast. Yeah. And do you, I, I know it's in development and you're, everyone's working in the middle of the crisis still, but do you have, do you, do you have an estimated timeline of when, when this rehousing plan might be presented? Um, yeah, I, it, it's, I would say soon. Um, I know that, you know, that the, there's a lot. It's been right. talked about enough and, and shared in big picture enough that it's um, it, it's got to be soon. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to get out ahead of itself. Um, so um, I, I can't answer specifically, but it, it, it should be soon. Well, I, I, I certainly for me and I think our committee is so eager to see this so we don't start trying to address things piecemeal. Right look in a more holistic way. And I think that this crisis has taught us to work differently. And I think this is a great opportunity. And so, you know, it, it, it's, it, whatever iteration you're ready to have a conversation, I, I think we're, because also the timeline's very short to try to figure out how to Right, right. You know, I, th I think that sort of the, 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 the big picture summary and text version it is, um, it's been distributed to a few folks for comments. So that may be showing up anytime soon. What is the challenge is the actual numbers behind everything that this 
is, you know, AHS's budget and plan, and that's what, um, you know, has to be, uh, you know, vetted and approved, you know, properly before it's out there for everyone to react to. Um, but I, you know, I'll check with, um, I know I have a call with Sarah Phillips and Allison Hart and AHS on Monday, um, where I, I think it's a, a final review of this stuff. So um, we'll just try to get a sense from them when they think they're going to get there okay. Thank you. And thank everybody. It's been yeah. amazing to watch. Yeah. All right. Representative Triano. Thank you. Um, so I don't want to go off on another tangent as I did last week, but uh, property taxes is an issue that's been on my mind. Now, when Maura Collins was here, she said that there have been some conversations so we can protect property owners and landlords from uh, foreclosure on their banks. But if they happen to be in arrear a year or two, arrears a year or two in their property taxes uh, and unable to pay them as a result of this, certainly they can lose their property to the town as a result of a property uh, tax sale. So, you know, I mean, this, we talk about, I, I think in terms of spiraling up and spir instead of spiraling down in the terms of uh, um, the ta cities and municipalities and towns that are now looking at lack of revenue for, uh, from these property taxes. And maybe we should be thinking in terms of uh, no interest loans to, uh, to cities and towns in order to keep them afloat without the revenue that's coming in from these property taxes. And I think that would be a little bit more in your in your uh, ballpark, I guess, uh, Commissioner. Um, yeah, thanks for the comment. I, I would, um, we've had a few conversations with Treasurer Pierce about the sort of financial instruments out there to do that for communities. Um, I would be um, pretending and making things up if I, if I told you I, I fully understood um, all the options and, and what the preferred action is. Um, she um, um, was waiting for some more guidance on one of the big sort of instruments that could do that. There's, there was some concern about um, some, some of the options there. So, you know, I, I, I can't fully answer your question. I would, I, I'd maybe reach out to her office and see um, uh, what it, where she's going on that, because it would, um, you know, it'd be probably a treasury solution that would have some of the state on the hook and um, and the League of Cities and Towns. They're both following that um, closely. You know, I think one concern, you know, there's been a lot of proposals floated, you know, whether it's helping, you know, small restaurants get back open or whatnot, that, well, geez, one of the biggest expenses that seem to never be forgiven that people still, it's all, it's all, you know, the rooms and meals tax or whatever it is. And why don't we forgive that? And, you know, it, it becomes one of these, well, that's our very revenue to keep things going and to provide the support. So do we, you know, cut off our own foot as we're trying to sprint here. And so, um, there's been a lot of thinking about that and, and thinking that, you know, direct stimulus grants loans to those industries with the COVID money, it's clear they can't use those directly to turn around and pay state taxes that that's, that's prohibited. But if they can use that money to pay their other debts or pay to restock the shelves, well, that frees up some of their money to pay their state taxes, which is going to allow us to all do the work that we know we need to do. So, I think some of the municipalities and the treasurer and, and folks are looking at those options to sort of not, um, uh, you know, wipe out what you owe as taxes to keep our government going, but find ways to put more money in your hands so you can pay those taxes. Um, but I, I don't have any more detail on that for you. That's okay. I just yep. go off on that direction yep. on occasion. <laughs> All right, being conscious, uh, being conscious of time here, I just want to, um, uh, Josh, I mean, there's so much, as you can tell, that's going on, and I appreciate you sharing with us all of the different moving pieces. We also understand, you know, we started off the meeting with an understanding that um, guidelines on how to use the money is, of course, a moving target as well, and so part of the delay or part of the um, processing in this in this stuff is trying to determine what, what how much can be used. Um, I'm less worried about 
what you're going to end up with in two weeks when 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 we put two billion dollars worth of requests in front of the administration um, as much as uh, that and then has to be whittled down but as much as I am about getting uh, being as inclusive as possible and and I think since since the um, the 13th of March uh, you know we are viewing all of this differently um, there is a sense that uh, we've always had a sense that if we do something for landlords, we need to do something for tenants and vice versa. And now it's this is a, this includes the money situation that we talked about earlier. Um, we talked about it legally with S three thirty three, but I would suggest that we, um, when it comes to what the VHIP program is, I think that you know just to remind you, when we passed S one sixty three last year, we this committee did in essence approve the VHIP program and it didn't go any further than just to the floor before it was pulled back at the beginning of this year. But it's a concept that we've taken a lot of testimony on this year. It's a, it's a it's an idea along with the rental registry and the and the um, uh, safety provisions that were in H739 that we've dealt with. So just keep that in mind as a vehicle yep. moving forward, um, regardless of the growth it might have to go through in order to take on I mean, it's, again, it sounds like two or three different bills that we've already taken testimony on. So to get there, to get an understanding of the number, because again, we have to request this of appropriations. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's all. I, I think. I think we're. We have a good background on what on what the um, issues are with with creating a program like this, and and so just keep that in mind mm -hmm. as you move forward. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, one other component I forgot to mention. It's it, it, it is in the framework of this plan um, is also, you know, we have a, a resource in some of our mobile home parks where, you know, there's some empty lots. And, you know, if we can strengthen the infrastructure um, in some of those um, and, and strengthen the, the long term viability of them by purchasing homes, putting them there and rehousing the homeless and, and sort of do this all together with these funds, that's another component. You know, it's not the be all end all, it's a small sliver and slice, but it could be the right um, fix for certain situations. And so that's also a component component that we, uh, all of the, the funders and the partners have talked about that uh, could be part of this plan too. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Sure, sure. And um, so I think uh, we will call it a day um, for us. Thank you, committee. This is, um, I'm just gonna bag out early. It's my anniversary, so I'm, oh, I'm as much as I as much as I love my legislative family, <laughs> I gotta go. Um, and um, so, thank you for Josh. Thank you for your time. I think it's uh, it's it's been great perspective. Again, we heard some good testimony from AHS, and I'm, I imagine we will continue to do so. And um, committee, I will work with. Uh, Ron, we're going to continue this housing conversation. Maybe we'll invite um, Sarah Phillips and see if post post Monday we can get her in or or the equivalent. But um, this is still an issue that I think is in development. And um, your ideas on this in terms of who we might want to invite next to hear from uh, moving forward is uh, just send them, send me an email or a text later, and we'll and we'll. Thank you.